Welcome to episode five uh, of the Daily Tide podcast. Um, Because of COVID, we're still not in the studio anymore. Uh, But today we still have a lovely guest, uh, Mr. Andrew. Hello. Welcome. Hi, Sophie. Thanks for having Um, me. Yeah, I'm very glad you're on today. Uh, so I'd just like to start with the land acknowledgement. We are on the unceded traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Coast Salish Nations, uh, both when we're at the studio and when we're at home. Um, to start, um, I already kind of pres- gave you an introduction, but uh, what do you do right now? What's your professional title? Yeah, definitely. Um, so right now I have kind of an interesting title. It's a split uh, title. And so I work three days a week for the uh, as a sea forestation specialist. Um, with OceanWise, and then I work two days a week um, as the online coordinator with online learning. Um, so right now, my my role is kind of split between um, this world of kelp restoration and cultivation, um, and kind of more of a project coordination and management side, and then a couple days a week of online education. So I quite like it. it's a nice balance of kind of the fun of education um, mm-hmm. with more of the kind of technical side of, of kelp, which is awesome. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, I know that like a lot of people, definitely, including myself, um, sea forestation and kelp restoration is kind of like a niche thing. <laughs> uh, that's kind of the point of the show. So it's always really, really cool. I get to speak with someone who's who's in a very specific field uh, of their mm-hmm. profession. Um, so start on a more of a broader context. What got you into marine biology, marine sciences in general? Was this kind of like an always forever love <laughs> or was this something that you got into um, in your post-secondary years? Yeah, no, it's been kind of an interesting um, career path or journey. I grew up uh, basically in Vancouver and my family and I used to camp um, on the coast of the, on the Sunshine Coast um, and up by like Vancouver Island. Mm-hmm. And so I grew up by the ocean and kind of have always had a love of marine biology. Um, and so throughout high school, um, I was kind of hoping to go into conservation whether that was marine conservation or maybe like forests or working with bears or wolves. I did a bit of work um, with raincoast conservation. I volunteered with them um, when I was in high school slash early university. And so I, um, yeah, I used, I love the ocean and uh, ended up kind of going into university thinking I was going to go into um, some sort of biology. I Mm -hmm. ended up in applied animal biology um, in my first year but that was under the kind of field of the faculty of land and food systems. And so through that faculty, I ended up learning some, like kind of taking some classes about food and food systems and um, got pulled into a completely different direction for uh, most of my undergrad um, and started getting really passionate about uh, food security and um, agriculture and kind of all of the things around our our food system, especially in North America, um, where we have so much food, but, a lot of it is produced in really um, like ways that harm the environment and the people that work in the food industry and in a very unsustainable way. Um, but then I ended up working with OceanWise after university um, in education and have kind of gotten back into marine biology. So the thing that I really, really like about the field that I just kind of, that I'm in, in kelp is that it's this intersection between the things that I'm the most passionate about. So it's an yeah. intersection between food and marine biology and, um, also working with people. So there's a really cool uh, mixture of making sure people have like an economic opportunity, but also um, working in this marine biology field. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that is a very interesting path um, kind of going through all these seemingly very different uh, broader ideas and then combining them essentially, which is um, kind of like what this podcast is as well, like the art and science and everything and communication all in one. Um, so what, what led you to choose your post-secondary, um, school and kind of expand on that? Why did you choose the place you went to? Yeah, definitely. So, um, I chose, I went to UBC, um, in Vancouver and I chose that partially out of convenience, uh, Mm -hmm. because I grew up in Vancouver. I had my parents' house to live in when I have like, I'm lucky enough to have a separate suite to live in. So, um, with that kind of like privilege to to do that it makes a lot more sense to go to local university but also UBC has really good programs around sustainability and around marine biology Mm -hmm. um UBC has a lot of really great um kind of co-programs with Bamfield and with 
um, Haidaguay. So there's lots of opportunity if you're into marine biology to go and do really awesome placements, mm -hmm. um, which funnily, a lot, funnily enough, I didn't end up doing. Um, but <laughs> there's a lot of really cool options for, for that. And um, yeah, and UBC is, it's a really like good school and the fact that it's universally recognized as quite a good academic institution. Um, it's not the most friendly place to go to school and you end up uh, spending a lot of time on the 99, but like the bus that goes across Vancouver. But yeah, yeah, yeah. that's kind of how I chose um, to go to UBC. And I chose the specific program within land and food systems because it was like an applied animal biology program. Um, and so it had kind of a really cool description of, of being able to go into biology and like zoology, but um, through more of an applied stream. Cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Would you say that for, for people who are looking um, food sciences, food security, conservation, would you say UBC is kind of like a good hub for that? Or do you have other schools that, um, that, that you believe also have like a similar kind of range? Yeah, absolutely. I think UBC is quite good for that. They have some really interesting professors and really cool programs um, that deal with, with food and, and kind of connect with community. Um, I think there's, I'm not sure about other schools because I haven't, I didn't really do a broad search um, mm -hmm. when I was applying for university. Um, like University of Victoria has some really good programs in that area. And I think food is also kind of popping up all over the place as a, like food systems are, are growing as kind of a field. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm sure there's multiple different universities and there's some really cool programs out of smaller local universities. So I think Kwatlin has a program where they have their own community garden. Oh, yeah. um, really great like community-based programs that are more hands-on um and yeah so I've heard really good things about that program as well yeah yeah that's good to know um I know that a lot of a lot of high schools right now have community gardens and that's like a thing that's getting bigger I know my school did um mm -hmm. <laughs> both in elementary and in high school so um yeah I can recognize that that's probably getting a bit bigger now too which is like a great it's a great thing I think it's a very important field that's kind of overlooked right now um, because of how we see climate change so far, um, we're not looking at those, those other things. Um, so you said you kind of, your area of study varied, um, a lot, um, expand on that a little bit. So what, what, when you started in, um, animal biology, what kind of, what was the transition point? What class or a professor, what kind of made you change there? <laughs> yeah, no, that, that's a good question. Um, I guess I've never really been like a person that has a very defined career and it's like, yes, this is what I'm going to be when I grow up, mm -hmm. which I think like some people I know, that's how they've, they've been. They've, since they were young, they knew exactly what they wanted to be and they went down that path and um, that's great for them. Um, <laughs> but I've never kind of been as, as uh, sure of exactly where I was going to go. Um, and I think a lot of people that I've chatted to, especially in to, like these days um, when it's kind of a complicated world there's also a lot of options there's a lot of really cool things to learn and to study and a lot of issues in the world that uh kind of can pull you in and I think that's kind of what what grabbed me with food is um it was this like I worked in a restaurant before um like throughout high school and so and my family is very food focused um so food has always been like something that has been important growing up and I think one of the classes, it was a, an LFS 200 level class. Um, I forget exactly the, the kind of course title, um, but it basically just gives an overview of, of the food system and then kind of addresses some of the issues that are exist within it. Um, and I think the scale of, of what was going on in our food system really drew me in. Um, so kind of in a way of just being like, oh, oh my, like, this is pretty messed up. Um, a lot of the ways that we think about food and produce food and package food and distribute food and our mm -hmm. relationship with it now, um, even though we live in a um, like very well off society um, and kind of understanding how this plays in with climate change and how vulnerable our food system is to climate change and how also it's contributing to climate change really kind of pulled me into to the field in a way of of yeah I guess when you see a system that is is broken or is uh really unsustainable it it draws you in a little bit 
Yeah, no, I can, I can totally understand and, and mirror that right now, especially, especially with climate change, which kind of actually works right into my next question. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, how has climate change seriously affected um, your your profession and career in general, uh, specifically with um, with kelp and, and seaforestation? Um, I've I've heard. I mean, I know that. Well, I said it's a niche thing. I have like read a little bit about it, um, mm -hmm. and I do understand that that kelp is much more important than we 100% take it for. <laughs> um, but yeah, is is has there especially since you've started in this field, has there been stuff that you've been able to see in the past few years that's been really hit hard? <laughs> yeah. So I think one of the biggest changes. Um, this is kind of before I ended up in the world of kelp, um, but there have been a couple marine heat waves. Um, and right now, one of the things that are, is happening in BC is um, there's a lot more data collection of how kelp forests are doing. So there is um, some kind of record of kelp decline in certain places. Um, there's been some monitoring and data collection, um, but there's not kind of a widely, like a wide understanding of how kelp forests have changed over time, um, at least in Western science knowledge. Um, so the more that we, A, look at past data, and also talk to um, elders of indigenous communities in BC, the more we kind of learn about how um, kelp forests are declining in British Columbia and how mm -hmm. like, for example, in Haida Gwaii, uh, there's a huge urchin barrens that have wiped out forests and that's a little bit more well-documented. Um, and so that's more to do with human, um, like overhunting of sea otters and other factors. Mm -hmm. um, but there was this really large marine uh, warming event in I think 2013 to 2017-ish range um, and so that had some really big impacts on kelp forests, especially in California and in Washington. Mm -hmm. And so now there's a lot of research going into that of, of trying to understand um, as kind of what you could call like a, a foreshadowing of, of climate events. There was actually a paper published a couple of days ago looking at um, marine heat waves and how they've increased considerably since the Industrial Revolution, which like isn't wildly surprising um, considering the ocean absorbs an incredible amount of carbon in the atmosphere. Yeah. So that's responsible for absorbing and storing um, a lot more carbon than I think we give it credit for. Um, and so as that happens, obviously the chemistry and the, the um, kind of makeup and patterns of the ocean are changing. And uh, so I think one of the projects that we're hoping to start and look into is uh, our sites in British Columbia where you could restore kelp forests and they might not be as affected by future marine warming events because it's something mm. that we're really is a concern. We, we're not entirely sure how quickly that's going to happen and what's going to happen and how that's going to impact the ecosystems um, mm -hmm. in BC. And so that's one reason to kind of look into climate change of how it impacts natural kelp forests. Um, but kind of the flip side of that is that kelp was only really recently there was a paper that came out in 2016 that was kind of this landmark paper you could say um about carbon sequestration potential of kelp and so before that people knew that kelp sequestered carbon and it was kind of like oh yeah like it it photosynthesizes so it takes carbon dioxide out of the out of the water in the atmosphere but uh this paper highlighted the scale of that and basically said that kelp ecosystems are really important for sequestering carbon and yeah. that carbon yeah ends up in the deep sea and gets sequestered for hundreds of years, if not millions of years, depending on where it ends up. Um, so it's now looking and kind of the big hype and the big change in the view of kelp in the last five to 10 years is that it can be a nature-based climate solution. Um, All right. So we can kind of deploy it to sequester carbon as well as to build ecosystems and feed people, which I think is pretty cool. Yeah, it's like a triple threat <laughs> of plant. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I remember. I, I I believe I read that paper as well because I. It's just one of those things where once in a while you hear you hear an ocean fact that seems like too good to be true, and then you're like, mm. <laughs> and then it is, and it's awesome. Um, so yes, I'm guessing right now that's that's something. Yeah, that's being really really focused on in that and that science community um, is just figuring out how to how to get, yeah, how to plant those and, and, and bring those around, um, just all the waters that, that it can handle to, to kind of up the ante on that production. But, um, yeah, I guess, um, kind of connecting to that, 
are there any projects right now that you've been working on recently um, in the past year or so uh, that you'd like to share with us? Anything that that's that's uh, that I don't know you've been really proud of <laughs> essentially uh, with Oceanwise and beyond um, that's that's surrounding kelp and, and seaforestation. Yeah, for sure. So it's kind of the the seaforestation program in in British Columbia and you know, at Oceanwise is pretty new still. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of what we've been doing is just talking to people. Um, because it's interesting. It's basically this new growing industry. There's a lot of different people doing a lot of things. And some people are talking to each other. Some people are not talking to each other. Um, there's a lot of science going on. There's a bit of industry going on. Um, so one of the things that we've been trying to do is, is kind of figure out who's doing what and how we can help um, either link people together, how we can help fill the gaps in knowledge that we are missing um, in BC and how we can also talk to people outside of this kind of little bubble of BC kelp to do things like not reinvent the wheel because kelp cultivation has been happening in Asia at huge scales. Mm -hmm. um, it, it has been only growing. So I think the market for seaweed doubled um, in the last 30 years. So there's been this huge growth. Um, so there's a lot of lessons that have already been learned across the world. Europe is already ahead of, of British Columbia as far as their kelp cultivation and restoration. Um, so one of our kind of the things we've been working on is figuring out what we know already and what we need to learn in BC. Um, but also one of the cool projects, something a little more like real is uh, we're in the middle of testing a restoration technique right now um, out of Bamfield called green gravel. And so that's a technique where you seed kelp, like small young kelp mm -hmm. um, onto pebbles. And then you drop those pebbles into the bottom of, of a area that needs restoration. Mm -hmm. um, so this is usually an area that maybe isn't super pressured by like urchins or things that predate on kelp. It's usually an area that might have been uh, wiped out by a marine heat wave before or by like another human impact. So something like pollution, but that has since uh, changed. Like the, maybe the logging operation or whatever was causing the pollution is, is gone. And so you can see that kelp and spread it. And then um, hopefully a small per percentage of that survives and grows into adult kelp. Mm -hmm. um, so right now we're partnering with a um, company called Canadian Kelp Resources out of Bamfield and um, a diving company there as well to test this restoration technique. And hopefully this provides something that's a little lower cost because that's one of the biggest barriers of kelp restoration is it's really expensive. Um, so hopefully this provides some sort of lower cost and something that can be transported around to like more remote areas um, mm -hmm. to then help restore kelp forests like all over BC slash other places. Yeah. So that's something that we're working on that uh, is hopefully going to have some positive results. We'll see in the spring how the first round of tests go on that. Mm -hmm. um, and then hopefully we'll be able to take that and kind of apply it to other sites in, in BC. That's really exciting. I, yeah, I think, I believe I, I heard Ocean Noise speaking about that, um, that big project. And, and frankly, I mean, I was like kind of jealous. I was, I would totally join in on that. That sounds great. <laughs> um, um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing how that works. Cause I feel like if, if that, if that can start working at like really a much larger um, scale, that could be really big. <laughs> that could be a very world changing, uh, if you will, um, yeah, that, that seems really exciting. Um, I'm guessing, so as you said, this is a bit of like a newer science almost or, or not as um, developed. Um, what did you find most intriguing about something that that is is quite, I, I keep saying it, niche? <laughs> um, and, and, and why did you get so excited about um, um, seaforestation in general? Yeah, no, definitely. Uh, well, and first of all, hopefully we'll have some sort of... Um, one of the things we're hoping to do is to involve more people in restoration. Yeah. Um, so we'll see how that happens. Obviously there's, there's many logistical things about that, but um, hopefully it'll be something that is a little bit easier to have people come and see what's happening and take part in that or take part in the monitoring process after. Um, mm -hmm. So hopefully through like maybe ocean bridge in the future, which is the um, kind of like youth to see is more of the age group of like, I think, is it 18 to 20 or like, or no, it's a little younger than that. It's right? a little younger. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, a, I believe it's about 16 or 17 to 18. So yeah. Right. 
And then Ocean Bridge is a little bit a program that's a bit older and it's um, focused more on learning journeys. So like these kind of more um, like you have the option and opportunity sometimes to go to um, kind of more remote places and, and check out projects that are going on there. So hopefully we'll be able to incorporate some, some of that into some education and some like learning into the restoration in the future. Yeah. Um, but to answer your main question, I guess what kind of drew me in about it's exciting to be on a project that is new. And I definitely, I think there's part of my, my brain that enjoys the, like the diving into something and feeling the excitement of a whole, a new field that um, yeah. is a little less explored. And the one thing that I have to constantly remind myself is like, it has been explored in a lot of places. And so we can take knowledge from other people that have done this already. Um, but yeah, it's it's uh, interesting. I kind of fell into the world of of kelp a little bit by accident. Um, mm -hmm. This was in a class in university, and we had a project where um, the goal of the project was to connect with a food producer or someone that kind of works in the landscape of agriculture or aquaculture or somewhere in in food production, and to basically ask them if they needed like solve one of the problems that they were facing or a barrier they were facing. And so I ended up, um, the professor that runs that course um, had a connection and was basically like, hey, does anyone want to like dive for fun um, for this project? And I was like, yeah, I'd love to dive for this project. <laughs> I mean, when I traveled, like this sounds great. And um, so basically that project ended up being a kelp mapping um, project with a uh, gentleman named Majid who runs uh, Canadian Pacifico Seaweeds and so we kind of did that as a project we didn't end up going diving but we did get to go and <laughs> survey and map kelp and then that kind of like spiraled me down this um this path and into this kind of cool world that I think and one of the things that really draws me to it is that intersection between climate change food and and like ecosystems and conservation yeah. Totally, totally. Yeah, that's a, that's once again a really interesting path to uh, of how you got into something. A lot of people have such like a linear way, but um, I truly believe that you almost get more connected when stuff happens by accident. <laughs> um, and I, I mean, I can say that like youth to see for me has been very much life changing. But it happened because I was bored during COVID, and then I looked <laughs> yeah. up like, what can I do right now? What's still happening? <laughs> so yeah, all those random things I think that it makes them a bit more special because you feel like it was like meant to find you <laughs> um, for sure it's it's kind of cool when something just it, it's fun to find something and then kind of go with it for a while and see how it how it goes um because sometimes you discover things that you wouldn't have thought to be insanely cool like I feel like yeah. if someone had told me that I was going to be working in kelp when I was like 18 I would have been a little disappointed if that makes sense yeah I'd yeah. Like, oh, that sounds kind of lame, to be honest. Um, but it turns out that once you discover something that you might not think you're super passionate about, but um, you might find a something that you really enjoy learning about or enjoy working with, and um, something that really sparks your interest. So. Yeah. No, I totally agree. Um, since you start, yeah, talking about a school um, again. Um, this podcast is is for students who, like I said um, earlier, want to go into marine biology, want to go into marine mm -hmm. sciences, um, but are a little unsure how to get there. This includes me. <laughs> um, and uh, one main question that I'm, I'm always asking myself, and I can guarantee that many other students are asking as well, is, is like, what should I know um, specifically about schooling and when it comes to science um, undergrad um, studies and um, uh, co-ops and, and all of the above. Um, if you had some advice that you'd like to give to yourself or, or to all students in general, what would it be? What's like the first thing that comes to mind? Yeah, absolutely. So this is pretty funny. I think I look back and the advice that I would give myself at UBC, if I were to go back and, and do another undergrad or mm -hmm. redo, yeah, tell my past self is to take more advantage of, um, <laughs> usually university is expensive. UBC is very pricey and yeah. you end up teaching yourself a lot of stuff because that's the way it works is you end up learning a bit in class, then going home and having to learn a lot of it yourself. 
Uh, but one of the things that UBC does offer that like is worth jumping on is they have a lot of cool programs and resources. Um, so one of the programs that I would have loved to done is uh, there's this program in Haida Gwaii. That's I think a whole semester. Um, and so my, my roommate's uh, partner is actually going to do that this spring, I think. And I'm super jealous because uh, I wish I'd done that. And as well as there's like interesting programs in like marine science centers, there's co-op placements where you can go and do research. So I'd say like, it's hard in university. I, uh, I was working, I was studying. I really like to ski as well. And so like, like, I didn't want to spend all the rest of my spare time doing things that are like in my career. I think mm -hmm. there's something to be said for sure for having um, a healthy balance of passions and hobbies, but also yeah. Of, yeah. of studies. Um, but I think I would have said to go and like, put a little bit more effort into taking advantage of the really cool programs that UBC offers, like do another, do, have done, having to do a co-op or, um... does that answer the original question? Yeah, no, totally. It 100% does. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I 100% I, I understand um, what you mean by that. Um, I, I do think that that a lot of the smaller programs that maybe aren't as developed or don't get as much attention are really underutilized. Um, mm -hmm. I've been lucky to be able to take some to, to take some of those courses bef before going into schools and stuff and seeing like the ones that they just kind of let anyone get into. Um, and and yeah, it's something to take advantage of. So um, I'm glad that more that you said that. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, another question kind of kind of based on 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 school. Are you planning to to get a, a more a future higher uh, degree at, at any sort in any other school? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> during during COVID, when I was uh, I graduated from my undergrad in May of 2020. Mm -hmm. um, so pretty much like as the pandemic was kind of coming in. So my, my last uh, semester was almost on like entirely online. Right. Um, and then I had a panic moment like six months after I graduated where I was like, I guess I should go back to school and do a master's. Um, in hindsight, I'm going to take my time, to be honest. I'm going to, uh, I'll probably go back and do a master's at some point. Um, just because there is, there's a lot you can learn from, from working. And I think I'll learn an incredible amount um, from doing my job and from basically just, yeah, learning things as I go. Yeah. Um, but totally. I do have a, a draw to like maybe specialize a bit more in something and and do some research or uh try to answer a question and in the field that I end up working in and I'm not sure if this master's is going to be in the kelp world um or if it's going to be in the education world because I, I also am very I think education is really really important and if kind of I look at a lot of these global issues a lot of what it boils down to if you actually wanted to like fix things is is education Mm -hmm. Um, so I think my career path will probably continue to be super wobbly in the future. Um, but I'll probably end up going back and doing, doing some sort of master's program. Eventually. Right. Right. But yeah. I, don't, I don't think there's a lot for that because I think there's a lot you can do. Unfortunately, undergrad degree seems to be a bit of a barrier to entry to a lot of jobs. Um, so having that is, is really, it just brings down those barriers, um, but I think there is a lot of room to to move throughout work without necessarily having to get a master's or a PhD. Totally, yeah, yeah. I'm planning to to move across the country <laughs> um, for my for my first year um, or post secondary. Uh, and I have been thinking, although it's so far in the future, about like masters and PhD and all that, um, without even really knowing what I want to specialize in yet. So <laughs> uh, I think a lot of people get kind of caught up in that. Um, uh, it's good to know that, yeah, it is possible just to learn on your own and get, you know, very similar results of, of getting higher in career and, and, and your profession and being fine uh, without, you know, spending a jillion dollars, um, <laughs> essentially. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. So to we spoke a bit about um, help and, and seaforestation and, and all of that. Um, uh, going more into the education uh, and and mm -hmm. and what you do there, um, I would love to to work in science communication and education one day. I think that would be really really cool. Um, and yeah, I guess I would I would love to hear a bit more about um, that and how that um, 
has has uh, kind of connected with seaforestation in general. Yeah, definitely, definitely. First of all, that's awesome that you're going to move across the country. Um, yeah. <laughs> where, are you, where are you heading? I'm uh, I'm hoping. Um, well, I'm, I'm going to Dalhousie, so I'm going to go from nice. Vancouver to all the way up there <laughs> to Halifax. Um, so yeah, very far, but exciting. <laughs> exciting. My friend's going to. She just started uh, law school at Dal, and uh, yeah. so she's loving Halifax so far. I think. So yeah. She's having a great time. But it sounds like a great place to go. It does, and it, apparently everyone says that it's like a really good hub for for uh, for marine biology right now. So I'm looking forward to it. It's gonna be good. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I guess more on the science communication and education side. Um, I have always kind of enjoyed education. So I taught uh, a bit of music and a bit of outdoor education throughout uh, university um, mm-hmm. as kind of summer jobs and side jobs. Um, and it's, I think education is like one of the most rewarding fields to work in um, because you just get to see kids learn things and be really fascinated with stuff. Um, and you can teach them about things that are kind of, I find a little more arbitrary or like we'll overlook when we're older, like how cool one species of tree is and the kids will be like insanely stoked on how cool that tree is um but yeah I think it's also as I kind of mentioned before a lot of the the issues as we look at a future like a changing world of of changing how we think about um consumption and uh, how we think about social interactions and um when we kind of see this interesting polarizing world to pop out um, where there's a lot of information and you have to do a really good job of navigating through that information and forming opinions and not trusting everything and not distrusting everything. It's a really like complicated thing. And so I think education is really, really important for building those um, kind of base ways of navigating through the world and, and understanding how issues and complexities and also um, being able to teach kids how to critical think is not my favorite term because it's kind of overused, but how to like be, um, be like very, I don't know, good thinkers and how to, um, how to live well with other people. So I think there's a lot of, of things there and, and yeah, so I work with online programs in education and uh, we connect basically for, for short sessions um, with, with classes. And our main goal is to teach kids like an inspire wonder of the oceans and kind of teach them that they are connected to the ocean and what they do impacts the ocean. And the ocean is super important for keeping them alive because um, that's a link that kind of gets lost sometimes. Like with food, um, we lose touch of, of how our survival is so reliant on, on the ocean. Right. And I kind of just dump all our stuff in there um and so yeah it's pretty cool it's it's fun education is fun like we we make programs that are interactive and so there's game elements and you get to watch cool videos of whales and um hear kids questions and um so yeah I think I really like education that's something that I hope to continue working in and and science communication I think is also super super important yeah, no, I, I, I love that. That's it's, I totally agree. I, I, um, I teach kids at a rock climbing gym, so oh, totally awesome. different, <laughs> um, but I can understand and, uh, that, that excitement that they get. Um, and when they finally realize like the connection between things, it's, um, it's really valuable for, for all forms of life and all, in all ways. Um, uh, yeah. So, so did you, did you focus on that in school as well? Or was that something you kind of, uh, just did outside of school and then continued on? Did you ever, try to look into a degree of some sort or, uh, or anything like that? Or was that, like you said, more of just like a strictly summer job kind of situation? So I never really looked into it um, like as a career or through school. I did a um, summer internship placement with a, an organization that I think, unfortunately, it doesn't exist anymore. It's called Think and Eat Green at School. So it's like kind of a UBC um program that was born out of the UBC farm and and a couple professors there and that the idea of that was basically providing funding and support for schools in the lower mainland to like include food education into their um like I guess their curriculum um so helping teachers fund a community garden or maybe 
um, helping start like hot lunch programs for certain schools and, and have the kids connect more with their food and understand um, where that comes from and kind of what it takes to, to eat and, and to grow food. So that was kind of what I delved into in, um, in university, but I've never really looked for, like I haven't, I've thought about maybe a, like going to teaching or my, my previous manager, Danica, is doing her master's in, in online education, which is pretty cool. Um, but I haven't quite decided on that yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's, that's really interesting. Um, I, yeah, I don't, I don't believe I've ever heard of that program, which is kind of disappointing. <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, that's definitely a, a program that I'll, I'll be trying to look for and, and uh, programs like it. Um, yeah, I feel like education is is overlooked in in most forms of science and science communication. I think is a really big kind of missing piece um, in the world right now. When you think about like the issues uh, when it comes to science, it mainly just comes with the with the translation of the information. So um, programs like that and and, and people like you <laughs> uh, genuinely are fixing that. So so yeah, just thank you. Number one, that's <laughs> it's really cool. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I really hope that. Um, in the future, I'm, I, I hope to contribute to that. And I hope that more people will, will realize that, yep, talking about it, using different language, depending on who you're speaking with is really valuable. <laughs> uh, it's really, yeah. It, yeah. I think, I think we've seen it a lot too. in over the pandemic that uh, yeah. it, there's a really huge gap between most people's understanding and including my own understanding of, of like health science and, yeah. and uh, it's really hard to get that information across. And, um, I think I'm actually reading this book right now. Do you know the Kutzkazart videos at all on YouTube? They're animated so. videos. They they explain kind of the like high level science concepts, but in oh anime. yeah, yeah 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 yeah. I totally know those videos. Yeah, I'll I, I'll def I put a, I'll put a link in the description of this um, so people can check it out too because those are great videos. <laughs> Yeah, those are, I think those are really good science communication videos because and mm -hmm. the the one of the writers of Kutzkazart wrote a book about the immune system that I've been reading called I think it's called Immune, but it's super cool because it's written like a novel. So it's written um like a it reads like sci-fi almost because the immune system's insane. Um, but he's done a really, really good job of like communicating these super complex things because the immune system is like one of the most complex systems because it's been evolving since cells existed but yeah. um yeah he does a really good job of doing that and then also addressing where he skips over detail really well and just being like yeah we could go into detail about this but like no one wants to know this unless you're in like you're doing your phd in immune sciences so like yeah we're gonna skip this and give you a nice overview so i think um there's been some really cool developments in science communication recently and hopefully that continues to to get better yeah, no, I, I I totally agree with you. I mean, I think that um that 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 YouTube channel is like a lovely, lovely YouTube channel, and I would one hundred percent recommend it. I, I like watch them for fun. <laughs> totally, I just I totally enjoy it. Um, uh, yeah. Um, so kind of going off of of science um education now and uh, going back into to to schooling. Um, you can see that kind of connection as well there of of how science education and schooling and and all that. Um, so now all of that's kind of uh, accumulated, I guess, is the good word to use um, into your into your job now. Um, for people who are who are maybe going out of, of undergrad and have gotten all these skills um, and want to start um, in something right away, what's a piece of advice you'd give for them, would you say? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I'd say that well, the one thing that I learned through this job is I took a job that it would start off as an internship, actually, um, because that's kind of what was available at that entry level grad uh, degree. So it was an internship in with OceanWise online education. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess the one thing that I've I might have just been really, really lucky. But I think if you're interested in things and you can pick up a job in something that's somewhat related to something you're interested in. Um, I think there's a lot of opportunities to, even if the job isn't perfect for what you want, even if it's not like, oh, this is exactly like, I want to write policy about climate. And I want to get a job exactly in this field. Um, my personal experience is you can, you can kind of figure out ways of, of making connections and, and change, going after things that you're interested in. So like one of the ways that I ended up 
in sea of forestation for ocean wise is is i connected with um the a couple of the the managers that run that and ended up doing a couple kind of smaller projects on the side yeah um, with them and just being like hey like i have a bit of time um i'm happy to do a bit of this for you and that kind of rolled into um what is now like a, a job and i think that um there is something to be said for for not necessarily looking for the perfect thing, but um, kind of following your interest and following a path of of trying to expand what you're doing and make a niche for yourself and something that you actually really enjoy. So yeah, um, it might be not super specific advice. No, it's um, yeah, think, that's true. <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah. 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 Um, sorry. Yeah. That I. I totally. I totally think that's 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 a good just piece of advice. It's just the communication aspect once again, just knowing people and and being open as well. Um, I think uh, you also had an advantage of of being pretty open in general about about career paths. And people who have more of like a linear idea might be harder because <laughs> they know exactly what they want to do. Um, but yeah, like just welcoming anything, I definitely think is is really great. Um, yeah, so you've given a bit of advice for people who are going into undergrad, who are leaving it. Um, how about people kind of everywhere in between? Is there anything that you would say is really important right now when it comes to um, kelp and seaforestation and climate change that just everyone should think about, work on, do, buy, whatever, <laughs> um, that everyone should know? Um, yeah, yeah, that's also a good question. I guess the first thing that pops into my mind is um, that all of these kind of like new fields that are developing, there, a lot of them are really cross uh, disciplinary. So you have to have a good understanding of, of kind of multiple things like social interactions, business, and um, not necessarily business, but like economic um, viability of projects. And so I think A, um, learn a lot about stuff. Like I think one of the things that I would recommend is, is kind of, always being open to, to learn new things and, and exploring avenues that um, are new and interesting um, mm -hmm. because the more that you learn and the more you learn, you can kind of start connecting ideas and there's a lot of really cool overlaps in that. Yeah. Um, and then, sorry, the question was more about what to do yeah. in conversation or? Um, in general, yeah. Uh, if you've seen anything right now that, that you know more people could do to kind of help out um, right. your area, uh, whether it just be like climate change in general or more specific. Um, yeah. Kind of any advice like that, that'd be awesome. Yeah, definitely. I guess. Okay. At a small scale, um, for kelp specifically, um, I think one of the things we're working on is just public acceptance of, of seafood and, um, thinking about eating things that are low impact seafood. So there's a pretty big barrier in, um, like Western society in particular, of thinking that things like eating seaweed and eating like oysters and mussels is kind of gross. Um, I know a lot of people are not a big fan of those foods, but those are some of the most sustainable um, foods you can grow in the ocean. So like fish is great, but a lot of fin fish, um, either it's wild caught and it's not necessarily the most sustainable. Um, some of it's farmed on land and that can be a little bit more sustainable, but either way, they're pretty high impact and um, they create, they use a lot of nutrients and they output a lot of waste um, whereas things like mussels and kelp and oysters are really low impact so building a little bit more acceptance of that food i um, mean our food systems i think is one thing that kind of everyone can do is um maybe go eat some mussels and and <laughs> enjoy them and try to try them in a different couple ways and think about eating some kelp because uh, that hopefully will be a larger part of our, our food in the future as that yeah. changes um and then as the larger scale stuff, <laughs> like for climate change, we've got a, kelp's not gonna fix climate change completely. Yeah. Um, we're, there's a lot of work to be done and some of that's going to have to be doing direct action and, and changing the ways that we live and the ways that companies operate. And uh, I think part of that is gonna be um, getting involved in more activism movements and um, doing protesting more and yeah. asking for change outright because um, change is slow. Internal change is really slow. Um, and while the world is changing as far as climate developments, there's everyone's aware of climate change. It's built into a lot of budgets. There's Canada's net zero by 2050 plan. 
ultimately, um, in order to fix some of the larger issues, it's going to require like some some more extreme um, yeah. fixes. So I think um, with with any of this change, there's things that we can do, like help learning how to grow kelp and sequestering carbon through kelp is is one piece in this huge puzzle of of climate change. Um, but ultimately, asking to change the way that our society runs is another big one. Yeah, no, that's that's totally right. I feel like a lot of people say that, but it's not hammered in enough that when we say change, we don't mean no more plastic straws. <laughs> um, it's huge stuff. It's really, really big. And, and when you think about how big this issue is, that obviously means what changes it has to be just as big, even bigger. Um, so when it comes to small, even smaller scale stuff, I think you should still think bigger. And I think that's a great way to say it. And I also never even thought about um, uh, mussels and, and eating and eating those those more sustainable uh, foods. I, I, I didn't even think about that. So thanks for bringing that up. <laughs> um, yeah, no, that's, it's pretty cool. Like it's one of uh, the, filter water um, and require really low nutrients. You don't actually feed them anything. They, they get all of their nutrients out of the ocean naturally. Right. Um, and so anything that does that and doesn't create a lot of waste, um, there's a lot of potential there for, for creating protein sources that aren't like in extremely inefficient, like cattle, for example, and beef where you have to feed yeah. cows an incredible amount of corn that you grow that degrades the soil. And then they also create a bunch of waste that we don't do anything with. But yeah, that's a other conversation yeah no no it's it's a good one though it's true um yeah is there any are there any other resources would you say other than like the book and the youtube channel um uh, that you think is is really good for all students in general and in, in general just people um that people should know about or, or or they can check out oh good question um give me a second to think about this yeah yeah no, take your time Horses. I guess um, a lot of like local smaller scale news outlets, um, like there's some really good articles of like in the, the Narwhal and the Tai locally um, mm -hmm. that kind of give you really good overviews of some of the things that are happening um, and some of the um, like cool research and more like factual climate science that's happening. Um, so there's really good ways to read articles there other resources. I might have to get back to you on this as far yeah. as maybe I'll send you an email with some, some stuff. Awesome. Um, That's perfect. Yeah. It depends on kind of what field you want to look into. Um, and, but yeah, I'll have to narrow that down in my mind. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and anything we spoke about and anything that you you'll send me, we'll add it to, you know, the description on, on Spotify and YouTube and whatever. Um, so other people can, can kind of keep learning even after this episode. Um, yeah. To, to, to know a bit, a bit more. Um, last question, I guess, before we kind of close off, um, are there any places that we can find you or any pro, uh, projects or programs you're in right now on social media, online, anything? Yeah, definitely. So um, if you wanted to look up, if you wanted to follow Seaforestation, um, there's an aqua blog that OceanWise releases. Um, so if you just look up uh, OceanWise aqua blog, it kind of, there's, I think, an article almost every week. And that's across the whole of OceanWise. Um, that kind of updates about some of the projects we're doing and hopefully we'll continue writing. We have a couple articles about online programs and about Seaforestation as well. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a good place to find that. And if you're interested in... Um, you should follow OceanWise Research um, on Instagram. They post, this is a little less seaforestation based, but they post really awesome videos of whales. So if you want to watch <laughs> some really sweet drone footage of whales, um, that's a great thing to follow. As well as OceanWise Education has a, a Twitter account. Um, so you can learn about some upcoming programs. And we're hoping to start to run more free programs in online ed education. Um, so there's a new site that we're launching um, with OceanWise mm -hmm. that can, uh, that'll have a bit more information about some of the free programs that are coming up. And so if you, if hopefully in the next year, we'll have some cool drop-in programs. So if anyone is interested in dropping in and learning about something ocean related, um, there'll be some opportunities for that. That is, that is fantastic. That's awesome. Um, yeah, definitely. We'll, we'll, we'll add all those too. Um, I know that also on, on my end, 
any Instagram account that OceanWise runs is always great. <laughs> um, yeah, their their youth account is really lovely, and and Youth mm-hmm. to Sea is obviously a really good one too. Um, so yeah, any any anything anytime you want to check anything out or or what they've been up to, I would say, yeah, those are those are also super super great. Um, yeah, Andrew, thank you so much for coming on. All the resources you gave us, all the information you gave us, it was lovely. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. Do you have any any closing words? <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. I mean, no, thanks for having me on. Um, I'm really excited to just be able to talk about kind of what I'm interested in and, and hopefully that was kind of helpful, um, to anyone that's in the field or is, uh, is looking to get into marine biology or education or, or science communication. Um, yeah, I think there's so much cool stuff going on right now. Um, it's, there's a lot of opportunities to work, especially in the field of like climate change, um, Mm -hmm. and sustainability, those fields are just growing. So, um, it's it's cool to be able to go into school or not go to school for that and and still know that there'll be lots of interesting projects and work um, in the future to do so yeah um thanks again for having me and I'll, I'll update you with some resources that i can think of fantastic uh yeah everyone that's listening thank you so much for um listening on to episode five um follow us on instagram check us out spotify and youtube and we will see you on the next episode bye